Uh, Israel and Hamas have resumed the fighting in Gaza, ending a seven-day truce in the region. The Israeli government says rockets were launched from Gaza overnight in the final minutes of the truce. The prime minister's office also claims Hamas did not meet its obligation to release all of the women hostages, thereby violating the agreed-upon terms of the deal. The truce had been extended and was set to expire at the end of the day yesterday. Diplomatic talks to continue the temporary pause in fighting came down to the wire last night, signaling negotiations may have broken down, but international mediators are continuing discussions in Qatar in the hopes of another breakthrough. Before the fighting resumed, Hamas released eight hostages yesterday. The group consisted of mostly women and included dual nationals from Mexico. Mexico, Russia, and Uruguay. In exchange, Israel once again freed 30 Palestinian prisoners. Hamas released a total of 105 hostages during the seven-day pause in the fighting. Israel freed 240 prisoners. It is believed about 137 people are still being held captive in Gaza. That includes a few Americans. The majority of the hostages are men. It's unclear how many of them are Israeli soldiers. And and let's bring in right now one of the authors of this explosive report, Ronan Bergman. He's a staff writer for the New York Times Magazine and author of Rise and Kill First, the secret story of Israel's targeted assassinations. Well, Ronan, that, that's just a perfect jumping off point because I will say in the United States, I'm sure in Israel, across the world, we've always looked at the Mossad. We've always looked at the, at the IDF as next level as the best of the best. Oh, that was in a Mossad operation. Oh, the Mossad always gets their man or their woman. That's, we see it in movies. We read about it in books. We, and, 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 and they've been Israelis uh, militarily and, and, and uh, in the intel community have, have been painted to be seven foot uh, 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 giants. Here in your, in your report, they're they're like in the U.S. would say like Mr. Magoo, with tragic consequences. They had the plans for a year and did nothing. Tell us about your reporting. Well, sometimes if to follow the money, if to follow your line mentioning books and movies and TV series, it turns out that the Israeli James Bond is not more than Inspector Clouseau, and. Um, what we saw is the biggest intelligence blunder in 50 years and a day. I think uh, Sinoar and Muhammad Def did not coincidentally chose that day. It was a Saturday, like the Yom Kippur War, the 73 October War, which was the result of a massive intelligence failure. It uh, was a day after the 6th of October, so the 7th of October, which turned out to be, I assume, the darkest day in the history of, uh, of Israel, much darker than, uh, than even the Yom Kippur War. The toll of death is the highest since the Holocaust. The intelligence blunder, if just to put this very concise, and I'm just, for, for one minute, please, putting Benjamin Netanyahu aside, intelligence blunder focuses on two main um, fiascos leading to the third. The first one was the total inability to assess what is in Hamas' mind, what is in Sinwar's mind, Yichel Sinwar, the leader of Hamas in, in Gaza. Israel thought that he is about being a governor, being the ruler of a state, a small state, but still a state that he understands that he cannot go into a whole uh, war with Israel because he will lose that state. Israel got it wrong. This is one. The Israeli intelligence got it wrong. And it was also Benjamin Netanyahu who got it wrong. He wanted to weaken the... Now I'm bringing him for one minute uh, back. Um, he wanted to weaken the Palestinian Authority, have a foe to Israel that would not be considered as a partner. He allowed money coming from Qatar and others. And so Israel thought that Hamas is deterred, national security advisor, to Benjamin Netanyahu five days before said Hamas is afraid of Israel. Hamas will not go to another defiance. They learned their lesson, he said, in a public 
interview to Israeli, um, Israeli radio. The second was about their capabilities, not the intentions, but the, the capabilities. And Adam Golden, uh, my friend and colleague at the New York Times and myself, are publishing this story that you mentioned. A year, a little more than a year before, Israeli intelligence was able to get the detailed plan of the attack that Hamas was planning for a long time, about 40 pages. Mm. They codenamed, the Israelis codenamed this Jericho Wall. And it's about breaking a wall. It's about breaking the wall, separated between Gaza and Israel, destroying the front, uh, ramping the uh, Gaza division uh, headquarters, killing the soldiers, and allowing many, many hundreds other Hamas militants to storm into Israel and um, kill civilians, kill uh, children, kill uh, soldiers. We know how it ended. But if you look at the plan, it's amazing. It's shocking. Both as a journalist and as an Israeli, the extent of knowledge that Hamas had about Israel, about Israeli secret fortification in the border. And I, I, I'm sure that one day we will know how they got this information, but this was not open source. Please. Mega. All right. Um, we're just going to put up here some of what was seen in that report um, up on the screen for you. This is out of the New York Times. Israel knew Hamas's attack plan again more than a year ago. Officials privately concede that had the military taken these warnings seriously and redirected significant reinforcements, Hamas followed the uh, blueprint with shocking precision. The document called for a barrage of rockets at the outset of the attack, drones to knock out the security cameras and automated machine guns along the border, and gunmen to pour into Israel en masse in paragliders, on motorcycles, and on foot, all of which happened on October 7th. And, and, and David... It played out exactly to the T. David, just shocking that even five days before this attack... Netanyahu and his cabinet were saying, quote, Hamas is afraid of Israel. So uh, they got it wrong at every level. It's clear that the intelligence uh, failure was, was deep in the Israeli agencies, that political leadership all the way up to Netanyahu was, was part of that misreading. I want to ask uh, Ronan, uh, Ronan, this is a, a, a stunning piece of journalism. Uh, I want to ask you whether the Prime Minister, Bibi, was briefed himself on Jericho Wall in this process. And, and a second question, your reporting describes an analyst who got it right. While everybody else was ignoring this intelligence, there was a woman who said, this is a plan for war. They're, they're coming after us. She took it seriously. Tell us a little bit more about her and why people didn't listen to her. When Jericho Wall was obtained, a um, super secret way to uh, have a copy from, from Hamas, this was the most updated uh, copy of a plan that they started to devise in 2012 and made it more and more precise based on more and more accurate intelligence. Israeli intelligence, both military intelligence and the Southern Command intelligence, looked at that. They, not, they did not disregard, but they said this is a sort of a dream, aspirational uh, plan. This is where Hamas wants to be, not where they are able to be. This plan was um, uh, detailing how 1680, 1600, and 80 Hamas commandos will cross the border in 60 different places. Israeli intelligence said they can only have 70 cross in two places. So the gap was significant. And nobody saw that the gap is diminishing, except for one person, uh, a veteran analyst, who warned that they are closing the gap. She didn't know that they are going to attack. This is the part of the intentions. But she said they will have the capability and some other intelligence officer just you know, pushed back and said, no, this is imaginative. She even said, we are closing into the 50th anniversary for the Yom Kippur War. Then 
in the southern of Israel, everybody thought it's just imaginatory to think that they will cross the Suez Canal. We should not disregard and uh, patronize other forces. We should treat the enemy as they should be treated. Ah. All right. Ronan Bergman of The New York Times, thank you very much uh, for that reporting this morning. Incredible. It really is. I and then finally, a call between McCarthy and Trump. Tell us about it. Was it like a wellness check or like <laughs> what, what are we talking about? That's actually a good question and that we weren't totally able to get to the bottom uh. to exactly why they were speaking. We were told it was sort of a routine checkup. Post yeah, we're to check okay. <laughs> McCarthy. That he they, was making sure the burgers were being delivered yeah, on time. That they both have jobs to do despite McCarthy being ousted from the speaker's um, seat. But that in the course of that call, Trump expressed to McCarthy why exactly he declined to get people like Mac Gates and these other hardline Republicans off of his back and, and back down from their uh, plan to remove him from the speakership by pushing forward this motion to vacate. Uh, Trump said that McCarthy was essentially insufficiently loyal, didn't endorse him, uh, didn't c bring to the floor two, um, these, these two bills that Trump wanted to expunge his impeachment inquiries. McCarthy, in recollections about these conversations to other people after the fact, claimed that he told Trump to, uh, he said, F you. He has said this before. This is a, a very oh, similar please. McCarthy story that we've right. heard, sort of the discrepancies between okay. his recollections of his private conversation with Trump versus what he actually said. McCarthy's people said he didn't curse him out. No, we've talked didn't. to people who said Ed, have. Ed, this is this is an ongoing oh routine God. by Kevin McCarthy, who claims to third parties that he shouted, screamed and shouted at Donald Trump and 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 told him to blank off and you yelled at him on january 6th you don't f with me you know exactly who these people etc cetera, etc cetera. and it, i don't know it never squares up we never hear him saying that publicly never hear him talking if he talks tough about trump he backs down the next day goes to visit him so i, I don't believe a word of it. i mean i'm very excited hey, thank by you the, exactly. the risk here <laughs> using <laughs> terms like f you we're getting very close to the edge yes yes <laughs> but i don't excitement. i don't believe a word of it either <laughs> i don't believe a word um I, I you know i can believe liz cheney saying f you to all yeah, yeah. exactly people, and then no, deserving yeah. it fully mm -hmm. um but mccarthy to trump no, George Santos is likelier to be to have a truthful resume <laughs> yeah. than, than that to be true. The, the best thing said, one of the best things said on January 6th, speaking of Liz Cheney, was when uh, a certain member of the, of the Republican Congress, well, Jim Jordan, put his, his, his hand, ha, our hand on her arm to help her, and she goes, get your hand off of me. You're responsible you for this. this. Yeah. You did this. All right. right. The Washington Post, Jackie Alamany. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Jackie. Good to see you. Happy Friday. Thanks, very guys. Important. Thank you for all the, the pop culture references. Yeah. It helps us. Anytime. It helps our cred <laughs> a great stuff, deal. Yeah. All right. Coming Look at the White House, the ribbon there, uh, celebrating World AIDS Day. Today marks the 35th annual World AIDS Day. But the occasion comes at a time when continued U.S. funding for HIV AIDS prevention hangs in the balance of a divided Congress. According to the White House, the U.S. global health program called PEPFAR, launched by President George W. Bush to reverse the HIV AIDS epidemic, has saved more than 25 million lives around the world. But congressional reauthorization of the program has stalled, with some Republicans claiming the money might be used to fund abortions. That, that's false. I just, I just have to say that's completely false. And this is front? another Tommy Tuberville type tactic yeah. to, 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 to look at, at things that are happening outside of the PEPFAR program that they may disagree and try to kill a program that has saved 25 million lives in the name of pro-life. That's to talk about the bitter irony of it. Yeah, all. new polling out this morning shows that a majority of voters across the board think it is important for the U.S. to continue its commitment to the global AIDS response. During the creation of PEPFAR 20 years ago, then Senator Joe Biden worked across the aisle with his Republican counterpart, Rick Santorum of Pennsylvania, to pass the life-saving legislation.
Morning, Joe. Chief Medical Correspondent Dr. Dave Campbell recently sat down with former Senator Santorum to discuss the challenges today. Why are we even having this discussion about abortion and AIDS relief? Number one is a lot of the organizations get funding don't just do uh, medical uh, assistance right. for people who are in AIDS, but they also do abortions, they do contraceptive, they do a whole host of other things. It's always been a tension in this program and the oversight, how those monies are separated and if they are, yeah. and the transparency is not what it should be. Is there any way to, again, through compromise, separate it, get the medicines where it needs to go and have the discussions that you're describing continue. Yeah, I'd love to see the president actually lead on this and step forward and be clear that, you know, we're, you know, I, I'm going to stay consistent with what, you know, Donald Trump and Barack Obama and everybody else has done in the past. We're not going to play political games with this program, pushing off his progressive base, if you will, and say, no, we're going to keep the compromise in place. And Mike Johnson, you know, do the same thing. That's what we need to have happen. I know President Biden, when we worked on this in the Senate, was a very strong supporter of this and, and was one of one of the folks that we worked with to get this done. Uh, hopefully he sees this as one of, uh, as I do, as one of the great accomplishments of my time in the Senate. And he'll want to preserve this program under, he, I, I can't imagine he wants to see this program fail um, under, his, under his watch. What yeah. happens if Congress is done for the year and it's not reauthorized? Yeah, the money's still there. Because uh, the appropriation is there and the money will be spent. Okay. But what will go away is the vital compromise that has kept this a, a Republican and Democrat broadly supported program. It's become a, a, a partisan program. And I'll go back to, you know, look at uh, on the issue of abortion, for example. I mean, you have when a Republican president comes in, they put in a policy called the Mexico City policy, which limits f funding for. And when the Democrats come in, they get rid of the Mexico City. Every policy. time. It's, yeah, happened, it's, yeah. it's back and forth and back and forth. You don't want this program to be like that. It's going gonna, it's gonna to cost lives. And I hope the president realizes that and doesn't do, do things that are going to uh, make this a uh, every presidential election partisan issue uh, as to how we're going to administer this program. The State Department provided a response regarding its PEPFAR program, which reads in part, quote, PEPFAR does not fund abortions, and PEPFAR funds cannot be used to lobby for or against abortion. And the Biden-Harris administration continues to urge Congress to pass a clean reauthorization of PEPFAR as part of our longstanding commitment to ending HIV AIDS as a public health threat by 2030. And Dr. Dave joins us now. He's a contributor to Forbes on issues surrounding health care, also with us. Democratic Senator Ben Cardin of Maryland. He's chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and he's out with a new op-ed on for MSNBC urging his colleagues to renew this world-changing legislation. Also joining us, visiting scholar at Johns Hopkins University, Maya Rockemore Cummings. She is moderator for an event the school is hosting for World AIDS Day, focusing on how marginalized communities continue to bear a disproportionate burden of new infections. And, and Senator, we saw the State Department uh, statement. Could not be any clearer. PEPFAR is not about abortions. PEPFAR can't, the money can't be used. The lobby for abortions can't be used to, to perform abortions. It's about saving lives absolutely. with AIDS. It's absolutely a fabricated issue. There is no funding for abortion in the PEPFAR program. The PEPFAR program is pro-life. 25 million lives have been saved. Right. I've been to Africa. I've seen the, the people whose lives have been saved as a result of the PEPFAR program now leading their country. We've seen it provide stability in African nations. We've seen it provide economic prosperity and stronger relations with the United States. This has been a transformational program, bipartisan, sponsored originally by President George W. Bush, bipartisan support. Right. This is the first time we've seen a partisan action by those that are trying to make abortion. It, it just makes no sense. And, and, and Dr. Dave, you've written, I've, I think, three, four articles uh, for Forbes, uh, and, and you just laid out what the senator just said. Uh, you, you, you laid out the fact that 
abortion is being pulled into this when it doesn't belong there by by some Republicans in the House. I'm curious, so what is the impact if PEPFAR goes away? There are some short term impacts, Joe, and then some longer term things. In the short term, it's going to pull away the confidence in those PEPFAR supported countries. In the longer term, it will suppress innovation. It will harm the ability for the programs to be developed and, and run. We, you, you guys all know how hard it is to put a program together. Imagine if now you only have a year window instead of five and you're trying to plan programs around kids and teenagers and young adults. It will suppress innovation, an, an overlooked phenomenon where the, the funding for new things like uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis that the, we've taken 20 years ago, it was about $10,000 per year per patient mm -hmm. to treat HIV. Now it's about $50, $40 a year. Five years from now, if we suppress innovation and money into funding and supporting uh, new products and services, it, we won't make the same strides. It will reverse itself. It's still a very active epidemic. So instead of saving lives, people... It, correct. Yeah. People uh, will die. Yeah. Uh, Maya, and you're looking at specifically marginalized communities and, and how they can be impacted. And, of course, you're moderating an event at Hopkins about this. Right. Tell us all about it. So we're actually hosting an event today called HIV and the Politics of AIDS. Uh, we're looking at the Minority AIDS Initiative at 25. Uh, many people don't know uh, that African Americans and Latinos have been disproportionately uh, represented amongst the AIDS population basically since the early uh, 80s. Uh, and in approximately 1987, actually, African Americans exceeded uh, white Americans in terms of the percentage incidence of HIV amongst the population. So this has been a black and brown epidemic for quite some time now. Uh, and in 2019, out of all new infections, African Americans and Latinos were 67 percent. Mm -hmm. So I, on, on the international front, uh, we know that you know PEPFAR has done a lot in sub-Saharan Africa. But I actually think that this argument about uh, abortion is a red herring. Mm -hmm. I think that we're seeing a continuation of the ultra-nationalist right wing. Uh, some people call it white Christian nationalism uh, efforts to basically go after uh, anything that supports people of color, uh, anything that supports LGBTQ communities, uh, anything that supports women. Uh, and certainly we know that the Minority AIDS Initiative, which was created in 1998 by Maxine Waters in order to address the disparities mm -hmm. and was actually undercut uh, mm -hmm. by the Bush, George W. Bush administration uh, in terms of its ability to actually um, uh, uh, fund communities of color, particularly uh, minority-led organizations, that we have a problem uh, because we have, I think, racism interceding uh, in our ability to effectively provide care. Uh, we know that now the new infections are hitting the South hardest those states that refuse to expand Medicaid. So we've got a problem in this country. We, what we did for PEPFAR was fantastic. We need PEPFAR for America, and we mm -hmm. need it to be non-discriminatory. So Johns Hopkins is looking at this today. Uh, the Center for Health Disparities is actually leading this uh, under uh, the leadership of Dr. Daryl Gaskin. That's fantastic. You know, Peter, though, what's, what's so fascinating is uh, Maya talked about how Christian nationalists, extreme right people may be fighting back against PEPFAR. The great irony of that is George W. Bush yeah. was yeah. moved by his evangelical exactly. faith. Exactly. You, you look at the people that were around him, Mike Gerson, Pete Wainer, other people that were around him, evangelicals, and, and, and told him, this is the yeah. issue of our time. This is what we need to do as evangelicals. We need to save millions of lives. There's a plague in Africa. We need to save millions of lives. Exactly. And so you have people that are claiming to be pro-life, trying to kill a program that was inspired by the New Testament. Yeah, that's exactly right. He, he called, George W. Bush calls in his staff. He calls in a guy named Tony Fauci. He says, what can we do to make a difference? Not just down the road with research money on a vaccine. What can we do to make a difference today? And Tony Fauci actually says, you can save lives by, by, by doing what you end up, he ended up doing. And you know who's looked at this allegation? that this current program is somehow funding abortions or somehow involved in abortions and decided it's not true? Mm. George W. Bush. Arguably the most pro-life president we've had 
since Reagan, right? Genuinely in his gut. Mm -hmm. Donald Trump, not really pro-life. He did a lot for right. pro-life interests, but he was not personally pro-life. Right. Uh, George W. Bush is genuinely pro-life. He has looked at this program. He has said there's nothing to this. And he's told the Congress this. And yet his fellow Republicans aren't listening to him. And I'm curious, Senator, when you think about that, like, wh who are the Republicans today who have influence over their colleagues who are blocking this and say, look, we understand your concerns. They're not borne out. Don't worry about it. This is not doing what you think it's doing. Who do they listen to, if not George W. Bush at this so point? Well, the problem we have, of course, is that the national groups are, are interfering with, I think, the common sense of, of the Republicans right now. They're concerned about how they get rated on a vote mm -hmm. rather than looking at the facts behind the issue. I mean, you're absolutely right. This, is, this program has been transformational. It's made a huge difference. If we don't reauthorize, it gives the message that we're not in the, to complete the job. Mm. And that, that we need the partners around the world to work with us. And if the United States is not there, the concern is whether we will be able to complete the work and, and rid the world of, of HIV AIDS. So uh, we are working with Republicans. I think that most realize we need to get this done. We're going to try to find a way forward. But quite frankly, they're concerned about the outside rating groups that say this is uh, yeah. against pro-life. Yeah. Uh, chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Senator Ben Cardin. Morning, Joe. Chief Medical Correspondent Dr. Dave Campbell, thank you for uh, shining a light on this continuously. And visiting scholar at Johns Hopkins University, Maya Rocky Moore Cummings. It's great to see you again, and thank you, you for coming on today. The season in Gaza has come to an end after a week long pause. Israel resumed airstrikes overnight after accusing Hamas of firing rockets before the truce was set to expire. Eight more Israeli hostages were released yesterday, along with 30 Palestinian prisoners. Among the hostages freed on Wednesday was a woman we first told you about last month, 36-year-old Yarden Rahman Gott. She was visiting family in a town near the Gaza border when the October 7th attack happened. Yarden was with her husband and their three-year-old daughter. All three were kidnapped in a stolen car. They then tried to flee, but the terrorists opened fire. That's when Yarden handed her daughter to her husband. The two of them escaped while Yarden was captured, recaptured. After 54 days in captivity, Yarden was reunited with her family yesterday. Wow. And joining us now from Israel is your den's brother, Gilly Rahman, who first joined us on the show last month when he had no idea about her whereabouts or how she was doing. Uh, things must look very different today. Thank you for coming back on the show. Uh, uh, how, good how, morning. Thank you for having me. How, how is the family doing? What was it like to, to reunite? I'm sure there are many different emotions. Yeah, um, obviously we are uh, relieved and extremely happy uh, and also worried about the general situation and also his yeah, sister-in-law, Carmel, uh, is, yet, is yet to be released. Oh. Uh, specifically about, um, about these moments, it's, um, it's almost incomprehensible. Yeah. The level of joy uh, of hearing her voice again, seeing her picture, um, meeting her, seeing Geffen, my niece, reunite with her, it's, I just, uh, it's truly, truly unbelievable. And I think that uh, every hostage family deserves this uh, moment of, uh, of rejoice and of, uh, and of peace and calm, knowing that their loved ones are back. And this is uh, beyond words. Yeah, I, I get that completely. Uh, just looking at the pictures. Um, has she been able to share anything about her time in captivity or is it too soon? Uh, she, she, she shared some. Uh, we are not allowed to uh, elaborate, but I, for example, I can give you, for an example, I can give you. We found out that uh, most of her time um, in activity in Gaza, she didn't know if her husband and daughter are alive. Oh. She knew about it only by a brief radio broadcast that she uh, overheard. Uh, somebody dedicated a song for 
Kinneret, her mother-in-law, that was murdered, uh, and mentioned that she and Carmel, her sister-in-law, are, uh, are hostages. And by that, she concluded that because Alon and Geffen were not mentioned, that they are not uh, either killed or taken hostage. So only after most of her time, she knew what happened to to her daughter and to her husband and that they were able to to be saved just imagine which kind of darkness she she yeah. uh, lived just a trauma for yeah. both sides of the family for the people waiting and hoping for her to come home but not knowing what her condition is if she's okay right. and the same for her in captivity not knowing if the daughter that she handed off to her husband if they made it well and and, and that's what we, we we keep we keep hearing of uh, so many not having any idea uh, what, what was going on beyond uh, beyond their own uh, terrible situation um, is is she re in relatively good health despite this horrific experience yeah I would say relatively well will be a good description mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right. and the family uh, where where are they spending most of their time together working with counselors is there a process to try and um, help them yeah, reassimilate? Well, um, as you probably know, uh, it took Hamas a long time to release them. It happened really close to the end of the mm -hmm. of, uh, of this day ceasefire uh, around midnight. So we saw her only at 4 a.m. Uh, mm -hmm. They were transferred to a hospital. So we've been there for a day. Uh, we spent the whole night there together and the whole day together in the same room uh, with a lot of counselors and uh, physicians. Uh, but uh, then we came back home. So we are now all of us at the same uh, apartment with my, at my father's place. <coughs> it's very fun. And we just came back from uh, the first time uh, taking my sister and her daughter to the beach. Uh, to be out in the sun, to feel the water, to feel the sand, uh, to to feel what freedom looks like. Mm. Gilly Roman, thank you very much. Uh, wishing you many more days like that with your family. Thank you for joining I, us I this want, morning. I want to remind us that it's how crucial is it to get back on, go into the process of uh, pauses and release of more hostages. Uh, it's crucial, and they have very limited time. Thank you for that. Thank you. We thank you. Thank it. you so much. And